I've been holding gunpoint once. Um, I've been in wildfires. I've been in riots and protests. And one photographer stuck his he kind of was blindly taking pictures over the over the hood of the car, and the rest of us were just like, it's not worth it to poke our head up and get shot because of this. So I look back on that moment now. And that's a very scary moment for me um, because that could have been very, very bad for me and a lot of a lot of my friends who were there working with me. But I think it's important to check in with yourself, um, make sure that you have the right motivations for, for why you're there taking pictures. When you're looking through the viewfinder, it can make you feel a little bit distant from the dangers that you're there witnessing. You know, you just have to be there. I think sometimes with stories, it can be very hard to figure out how you approach this. What's my entry point? How am I gonna possibly uh, take this entire person's existence and put it into 12 pictures to tell the story across. And I think the most important thing is to not get too in your head about it. And just remember, like, you just have to be there looking through the camera. Um, and eventually those moments will, will reveal themselves to you. Can you give me an insight into what it's like covering major Washington politics? Yeah, it's kind of like a weird organized circus um, that seems to be very coordinated, but at times it's just chaos. Uh, as fun as this job is, sometimes it's important to take a break and go for a walk with your dog or sit on a patio and drink a glass of wine and, and take time to, to be myself. I think that I struggle to um, not work myself to death. Um, I try to work as much as possible and I, you know, after a certain while you get mentally and physically exhausted and you can't, you can't shoot very well anymore. Hello and welcome to Shutter Talk, the podcast that delves into the captivating world of photography. I'm your host, Stan Platt Jones, and today I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to sit down with the incredibly talented freelance photographer, Nathan Howard. My name is Nathan Howard. I'm a photojournalist based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been covering local and national news in this country for eight years now, uh, and hopefully we we'll continue to do it for many more years. Nathan has established himself as a prominent figure in the field of photojournalism. His remarkable portfolio boasts collaborations with renowned media outlets such as Getty Images, The Associated Press, Reuters and Bloomberg. Prior to his freelance career, Nathan honed his skills as a staff photographer at publications including The Columbian in Southwest Washington, The Newport News Times and the Moscow Pullman Daily News. Nathan's work serves as a powerful lens through which we can explore a range of pressing issues, from capturing the intricate dynamics of US politics to shedding light on the devastating effects of climate change. He fearlessly confronts the complex realities of our world. His lens has also focused on the rise of extremism in the American West, providing thought-provoking glimpses into the challenges our society faces. In this episode of Shutter Talk, we have the privilege of diving deep into Nathan's extraordinary life and career. Join us as we explore his most cherished moments behind the lens, the lessons he's learned along the way, and the regrets that accompany a creative journey. So, get ready to be inspired and educated as we unlock a world of photography through the lens of Nathan Howard. Welcome to Shutter Talk. Right, let's start from the beginning chronologically. What was life like growing up? Oh, wow. Um, I grew up in Redmond, Washington, which is a suburb outside of Seattle, Washington. It's where Microsoft is headquartered. That's wow. It's almost people know it. Um, and yeah, um, pretty white middle class community kind of thing. Um, not all that exciting, not much going on. Um, and I didn't have really as much direction. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and so I, we had a program um, at my high school, I'm not sure if they have something similar in the UK, but um, we can take college classes while you're still in high school. Um, so I did that, and I moved into it pretty heavily. Um, so by the time I was in my second and third or, or second and third year of high school, I was taking all my classes at the local community college, um, and they had a student newspaper there um, that I decided to join for lack of a better idea, to be honest, and just really fell in love with it right away. Um, and that was kind of the start of the path down to photography. Um, I'd always had pictures around the house. My father was an amateur photographer. He had a Nikon FE2 film camera that he would use. Um, and he had, you know, some building landscapes, stuff like that around the house. So 
I was always kind of aware of what photography was and that there was people out there doing it, but I didn't really get into it until I was um, 17 ish, I think was the first time I really picked up a camera. So. Was that um was that school newspaper or film or have you always shot digital? Yeah, it was it was digital. I'm I'm 31 and so now um and so they you know digital really became big in the in the news world about the time of 9/11 and the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um those were which was before my time. I was I was too young to be working at the time. I think I was nine or 10. Um, but that was when a lot of newspapers switched over to digital. Um, so yeah, so by that point in time, that's your newspaper. It was it was digital, and and I don't have a ton of experience with film photography. I do it. I've got that same Nikon FE2 camera that was my father's. I have it, um, and I shoot on it on occasion. But uh, for work, yeah, it's all digital, and it kind of always has been. What was your first big gig, and how did you approach that with little experience? Um. I guess it defined, depends on how you want to define big gig. Um, you know, I think the one that was the most influential and the one that kind of started me down the path that I ended up on was um, not at that same college newspaper, but later I transferred and went to Washington State University, um, which is where Edward R. Murrow went. Um, and they had a student newspaper there that I was also a part of, and I got a, a job as a photographer there on staff and they paid you like, 20 bucks a day or something uh and i had an editor um who did not end up in photography but at the time was a very good photographer and he gave me one or two early assignments when i first got there um and that was the first time that i started getting direct feedback from somebody about what i was shooting and they'll photograph something come back and you sit down and go through the pictures um and so i think those were the, the biggest in the sense that it was the most meaningful they were they were mostly you know little news stories around the campus or sports events um but uh that really was the first time that i saw that i was i had some sort of talent at this and i was shooting um a, a lot of the people the people were very talented but i could tell from the reaction i was getting and from what i was doing that i was shooting a little bit better than, than than the rest of the folks um so yeah that was that was the big gig in the sense that it gave me a, a bit of confidence and i saw a path forward uh, um, to phot photojournalism as a career um, and then before I graduated from that college, I got a part-time staff job at the local newspaper, which was the Moscow Pullman Daily News. Um, I think the circulation was like 5,000 or something like that. That might even be higher than it was. Um, and that was my first like actual adult job as a photographer. Um, that was 20 hours a week, mostly photographing breaking news and, and local college football and that kind of stuff. Do you struggle maintaining a professional distance from those subjects? Yeah, I, I think it depends. Um, there's some stuff that's easier to remain distant than others. Um, politics, I find it pretty easy. Um, some of that is because there's usually some sort of infrastructure set up to keep you physically distant from the subject you're photographing. So, for example, you know, if you're photographing the president, um, you're, you're pretty close to him, but you're not sitting there shaking hands and, and making small talk with him. Um, so politics, I think it can be easier um, to keep a distance. I think other stories, it can be quite tough. Um, and and I think, too, that if you're completely emotionally distant from the story that you're, you're photographing, you're often not doing it correctly. So one of the stories that comes to mind was a couple of years ago, I think two years ago now, um, I worked in a story for the Associated Press about a woman that had gone missing um, in Northern California and her family was trying to get the search going again. She'd been missing for, I think, six months at the time. And um, she was an indigenous woman. And here in the States, we have all sorts of, um, uh, there's a lot of red tape and um, intentional or otherwise issues where local law enforcement can't work with tribal law enforcement. And so this woman had gone missing and the search had kind of stalled. And so we, myself and a reporter, um, Gillian Flockus, who's a phenomenal reporter, we went down and, and spent a week working with the family and learning about this girl's um, life and history and then learning about the search that had started and why it had stopped. And, and we did a big piece on that. Um, and it actually got the search restarted and they continued looking for her. She still hadn't been found. Um, but for a story like that, you know, you're spending a week in these people's homes, you're eating with them, you're, you're hearing intimate stories about what your subject's childhood was like and 
the traumas that they endured and kind of how they got to this point. And if you're, as a photojournalist, I think that if you're you're there and you're not forming some sort of emotional attachment, um, then you're really not doing your job correctly. Um, so in that sense, it can be it can be good, um, but you do really need to know what the line is. Um, something else that comes to mind is during the 2020 um, civil rights protests in the U.S. Um, usually referred to as the George Floyd protests. You know, I was in Portland, Oregon for um, the entire year that that went down. We had a hundred consecutive day of days of protests there, I and mean, they were pretty they were pretty violent. There was there was a lot of arrests. There was a lot of um, police intervention. There was a lot of brawling between far left activists and far right activists and. I watched a number of photojournalists kind of lose the plot a little bit on that and um, begin either taking a more activist role uh, in the protests or becoming very anti-police. Um, and that's stuff that, at least on one occasion, I know um, derailed an entire career for at least one part that I know. So, you know, I think it's an incredibly difficult job and that you have to find a balance between building an emotional connection, like I was talking about the, the family of that missing girl and also knowing where the, the line is and knowing how to get up to it as close as you can but never cross it. It's it's it can be very challenging, yeah. Have you ever crossed that line? Um yeah, I mean I don't know. That's that's a good question. And I think that um if you ask certain people, they might have a different answer than I do. But I, I don't think that I've crossed it. I don't think I've, you know, gone across the Rubicon as they say and and to a point of no return. I think that you know, it can be very, it can be very hard to realize how close you're getting to certain stories. Um, and especially if you're working in a small community, like I did at the start of my career, and um, you're working at local newspapers, and, you know, you're in towns of 20,000 people, and, and everybody is keeping an eye on the stories you're doing, and you're very, you're in it, you're reporting on, on stuff that's there, but you're also kind of in the community yourself. And so, um it can be difficult to kind of keep your head about you i think on on some stories i don't know if i've if i've crossed it i think that um there's definitely been times where i've had to sit down with editors or photographers or friends or family and kind of be like here's how i'm feeling about this story right now i think i might need to take a break i think i might need to get some outside feedback i'm not sure if my head is on straight with this one um and i think I've definitely had to do that. I don't think I've ever crossed the line, but I've definitely had to take a step back and say, all right, this story needs to go on hold for a couple weeks so I can get my head on straight and make sure I'm approaching this like a professional and I'm doing I'm doing justice to everybody that's in it, um, making sure that I'm not doing anything unethical. So. You talked about the missing project. You have another project that really stuck out to me called uh, Living with Adam. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit more about that project? Yeah. Um, I actually shot that story um, doing a workshop called the Missouri Photo Workshop, which is a phenomenal um, photo workshop in um, rural Missouri. They choose a small town in, in Missouri um, every year and you bring in about, I don't know, maybe 70 photographers from across the world, and you work with the intimate and with editors, and you shoot it and you kind of, um, photographers kind of flood the small town into here. It's, it's, it's a great time. but. That was a story about um, a young man uh, named Adam Goza, who, when he was, I think, 19, he was cliff diving with his friends and he was drunk. And he broke his neck um, and was wheelchair bound and will be likely for the rest of his life um, paralyzed uh, pretty much from the neck down. He's some movement of his arms, but not much. Uh, and the story really was about his mother, who his entire life was derailed the same day that Adam's was because now she had to be his full-time caretaker and be with him 24 seven. He was incredibly dependent on her. Um, and so I spent about a week with the family and trying to kind of get a sense of what that must be like to have a son who you expected to go off and live his own life now be completely dependent on you. And, and that would likely be her life for the rest of her life. Um, and we also kind of explored what will happen when she is no longer around to take care of him and, um, you know, it was a very, it was a very personal story that gave me a lot of access to their lives, um, which can sometimes be difficult. But with them, they just said, uh, yeah, doors unlocked, come by any time. So um, I spent about a week with them doing that. And it was, it was great. Um, and 
uh, those are the stories I like doing the most, the ones where you're, uh, you kind of have a project and you can just go spend endless hours with your subject, trying to see like the intimate details of their lives and try to relay that somehow um, in pictures. So yeah, I, I have a lot of fun in that one. Um, they really liked the story and uh, it actually is something I'd like to go follow up on at some point in time if I have to get the chance. When you cover those really intimate projects, how do you approach them? Yeah, I think you just, I, I try to ask a lot of questions. Um, I had a, I had a mentor of mine, a great photographer named Tyler Tomsland, who uh, is a staffer at the spokesman with you out in Washington. Um, we met when I was in college, but he, he gave me a lot of feedback on those stories, not that one in particular, but stories similar to that that I've worked on um, throughout my career. And one of the things that he says is you just kind of have to listen, you have to ask questions, you have to find out what's important to these people. Um, and then you just kind of have to be there. Um, it's an old it's an adage in some circles of photography, they say F6 and, or F5.6 and be there. Um, the idea that just like the, the most important thing is just to be there when these things happen. Um, so I think it's a mixture of spending a lot of prep time showing up to meet these folks. Usually I don't take a camera with me the first time that I meet them. I'll have one, but it's, it's away in a bag or something. And I just sit there and try to talk to them for a while and find out what's important to them and, and what they see, you know, what their, what their reasoning is for letting me into their lives, because that can be very intrusive to have a guy with a camera following you around for days on end. Um, so I try to kind of get a sense of where they're at mentally and what they're expecting from the story. And then, like I said, find out what's important to them. And, and then you just spend as much time as you can with them and you photograph everything and you try to be unobtrusive. Um, uh, and you usually are successful. Um, and then, you know, I try to also not have any, um, what's the word I'm looking for, preconceptions about what I'm going to see when you go in. Um, I try to just kind of photograph what I'm seeing as it's happening and then kind of try to put the story together afterwards as opposed to coming up with what I think the story should be beforehand because I think that changes the way that, that you shoot stuff and it makes it so you uh, you put your own vision into stuff, which can be good, but I, I have to let the subjects tell the story. So. So far on the podcast, on the podcast, I've asked the same question, and everyone's given a slightly different answer. So I'm really intrigued to see what you're going to say. Photojournalism can address and raise questions about power, identity, and faith. Why do you choose photography? Wow, um, that's a good question. Uh, for me, I was always attracted to the idea that. Uh, journalism can provide support and a voice to people who might otherwise be ignored by institutions that are supposed to be helping them. Uh, I don't think that we get it perfect, but I think that it's a tremendous resource for people who are experiencing injustice or people who um, have had something terrible happen to them and they don't have recourse or just to, to show the good in the world. Um, I really enjoy being able to take a moment, see see a moment of happiness or, or despair or curiosity and, and photograph that and show it to somebody who never would have otherwise gotten to see it. Um, and I find a lot of joy in that. I, I think it's almost a magical thing to be able to bottle those, those moments in time and show them to people across the world. I think it's tremendous. That, uh, and I'm, I'm blown away that I'm able to do it. Um, I feel very fortunate. Um, and like I said, I like that there's a, there's a certain level of, um, we have an ability to help people. Um, growing up, one of the things that uh, my parents taught me was that it didn't really matter what you did as long as you found that there was value to the world in doing it. Don't just sit in an office and, you know, toil away making money, do something with your life and try to, try to leave it a little bit better than you found it. The way that I've, Found to do that is through photojournalism to try to find stories that are important to me or important to somebody else that might otherwise be getting ignored. Um, photograph them in a way that is hopefully powerful enough to change their minds and to help some people out. So it's kind of a long answer, but um, that's why I'm drawn to it originally and why I still love what I do. Where do you think that want and need to tell stories comes from? You know, I don't know. I think that um, it would be very easy for me to sit here and give a uh, an answer about oh I think you know it's the importance of um, of uh, 
helping people. And I think that that's, that's there, but I think creatives, um, and if you're a photojournalist, you're a creative person. Um, I think we're in a sense, very narcissistic. We like to see our names and lights and we like to say, like, Oh, look at this picture that I took. That's, um, so great and so powerful. And so I think it's kind of a mix. I think that I enjoy helping people. I've always, um, found, uh, sorry, I've got somebody walking in here. Um, I think that, uh, I've always enjoyed um, uh, doing something for somebody that otherwise, you know, it would be done on their own, you know. Uh, but I also really enjoy the process of photography and creating pictures that other people enjoy looking at. And if I can help people a little bit in the process of making those pictures, I think that that's a great add on. Um, but yeah, I think some of it is just the, we like the, the attention of, of creating cool pictures that people look at and go, oh, wow, how'd you do that? So, I think it's probably a little bit of a mix. You talk about um, taking pictures with a meaning and a story behind them. Do you ever struggle choosing shots because every shot has a different story behind them? Oh yeah, I'm I'm a terrible editor of uh, of myself and other people, but I'm yeah I'm uh, I always need help putting together an edit of what I've shot, um, especially on especially on uh, projects or stories that I'm working on. You know, I think that it can be really hard for photographers to edit their own work because, um, you know, we see in every picture what we were trying to do. Um, and so for me, and I know I've heard this from other people as well, you're always seeing what you didn't quite achieve with the picture. Like, you know, you had a vision for what you wanted it to be and it's, it's fallen a little short, so it might still be a great picture, but it's not everything you wanted it to be. And so it can be very easy to be hypercritical and, and almost see the flaws in the work that you're doing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at choosing pictures. Um, uh, Luckily, I've got a, a great network of other friends who are photographers who would be helpful with that. Um, but yeah, it can also be very frustrating to get near the end of a project and realize it's not quite telling the story that you wanted to tell or it's not quite hitting on all levels that you wanted it to hit. Um, and that is unfortunately just part of the job of a photojournalist is sometimes you're not perfect. Usually you're not perfect. Um, and you kind of have to just uh bear down and deal with it and hope that you should a little bit better the next time in a world where any image can be generated by ai or anything can be googled do you think photography has become redundant or do you think it's even more important nowadays that's a great question and i'll uh, say apologies for the uh, ambulance that was just going by i live in dc and so there's quite a bit of traffic um that's a good question. I think that even when you're when you're looking at uh, the, the answer is no. I don't think that the photography is is become obsolete or is redundant. Um, you know, even if you're looking at AI, you know, those generators still require a prompt. They still require you to put something in. Um, so in that sense, there's still a creative vision behind what um, the AI is generating. Um, but the other thing is that all those AIs are trained off of you know the work that photographers have done. So Really, what they're doing is mimicking. They're not fully creating something new. Perhaps they'll get to that point. But right now, um, you know, they're they're functionally just mimicking other work of the photographers. So, if you want something new and impactful, I think you're still going to need a photographer. I don't think AI is really going to be there. Not to say that it won't eventually, but right now, I don't think it's there. Um, I know a lot of photographers have a very critical opinion of AI. I don't share that. I think it's a fascinating technology. Um, I think that it's going to open a lot of doors for creative mediums. I don't think it's ever going to replace photojournalism. I think it might play a role in some future melded medium between photojournalism and AI. Um, there'll be ethical things that we got to figure out as we go. But, you know, I don't think that uh, it's a big, terrible thing for the creative industry. I think it's just one more tool that people can use. Um, and I'm very interested to see how it blends in. Now, I think we have to be careful with that. I think we have to be responsible. Um, I think it was the, I, I don't specifically remember which outlet it was, but there was a big, I want to say maybe it was the New Yorker. They did a story on like people on the subway and they used a bunch of AI generated pictures for that. And they were transparent, they were AI generated, but they also didn't quite, um, it wasn't quite the same thing. You know, it, it was, it felt a little dull. So people are trying to, to bring it into photojournalism and try to bring it into the editorial world and we'll see it happens. But I think that, until AI is truly at a point where it's sentient and it can come up with its own ideas, you're still going to need photographers out there who are 
approaching something creatively and uniquely in a way that only their eyes can. And I'll point out that if you spend two photographers on the exact same story, they'll kind of back to dramatically different pictures just because we all approach things differently. And so um, I don't really see AI uh, replacing that anytime soon. Do you think you have a unique style? And if so, how have you developed that style? Uh, I like to think that I do. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know if I definitely do. I like to think that I do. I think that, um, especially when you've been in this industry for a long time and you are looking at the pictures that your colleagues take every single day, it can be pretty easy to recognize a picture by like somebody like Tom Brenner, who's a DC photographer out here. He's got a very specific eye, a very creative eye. You can kind of see a picture I take and even without seeing his byline. Like, yeah, I can kind of tell us Tom Brenner for and you can do the same thing for a lot of other people. Um, there's a great talk named Beth Nakamura, who's a staff photographer for Oregonian. I was just talking to her the other day about how I saw one of her pictures somewhere in the world. And I knew immediately it was one of hers just because she has a certain eye that she approaches with. Hopefully, I have a similar eye and style that people can tell from a distance. I don't know if I do. I'm told people have told me that I do, but you know, who knows? Um, I look at a lot of how I developed it is I look at a lot of photo books. I look at anything visual. Um, I love graphic novels. I love any visual medium. Um, and I like looking at how other people tell their stories. Um, and then I just try to incorporate that into whatever I'm photographing. I've always loved weird pictures, things that make you kind of fall and go, wait, what's going on there? Um, so I look for that every time I can. Um, and I think another thing about at least my personal styles that, you know, I'm from a very traditional news photographer background. I started at local newspapers and started moving up to slightly larger newspapers and slightly larger newspapers until I was at a national level. And so for me, I approach things like kind of an old school, small town photojournalist. I think if you look at photographers who either went a different path, they were kind of from a different industry and are now doing photojournalism, um, you can tell that they have to commit come in from a different entry point. It can be kind of hard to like, quantify like what it is you're seeing, but you can kind of tell when somebody has a traditional newspaper background or somebody's coming more from like, the arts world. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I that's how I developed mine. And I think hopefully people are able to tell that that picture is mine, but uh, sometimes I'm sure I create generic pictures. <laughs> we all do. What advice would you give to someone living in a small town who's frustrated because they want to be photographing somewhere like Washington or New York where there's more action. Yeah. Um, I would say be careful what you wish for. I asked somebody who was in a small town and wanted to be shooting for bigger papers and working on bigger stories. I think I really, you know, I spent five or six years at small newspapers before I started working for slightly larger outlets and, um, I don't think I quite realized what I had until it was gone. Um, when you're in these small communities, where you have tremendous access and you don't have a lot of competition. Um, your ability to spend time on unique time on unique stories that nobody else can work on because nobody else is living in, you know, for me, like the rural Oregon coast where there's one newspaper and a tremendous amount of stories and nobody else is looking to tell them. Like that is a, that's a gift and. Um, I think when you get to a slightly larger level, it can be hard to distinguish yourself because we're all covering the same things by and large. Um, you know, everybody's in Ukraine and everybody is in D.C. covering the political sphere or everybody is, you know, in New York responding to the same national story. And those stories are important. And I'm glad that you're doing it. I'm glad that there's talent doing it. But it's, I think, probably more important to have photojournalists journalists in small communities where nobody else is paying attention. Um, and as a photojournalist in one of those communities, you can tell really unique stories that can help you stand out later in your career if you go that way, um, or just continue to help help people. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to like what you want to get out of photojournalism. If you just want to get your name up in lights, like, okay, maybe a small town is with you. But if you want to do good and practical work that has like a legacy of, of helping people and telling stories, small communities can be tremendous places to do that. Um, so, yeah. I would be patient and try to realize that you have something really good going for you. What moments or photos have really affected you? You know, there's a moment from 2020, and I sent you one of these pictures where um, it was during the George Floyd protest in Oregon, and 
Um, we'd had, they put a security, a security fence up around the courthouse where most of the protests were taking place. And a woman had, I can't remember if she had jumped the fence. I don't, I don't remember why, but she had made her way to the other side of the fence. I can't remember if they left the gate open and she'd gone through or if she climbed over. Um, but she had gone through, I think, to put a sign up against the wall, um, like a, a sign protest of the peace force there. And federal agents came out and grabbed her and another protester as they were trying to make their way out. Uh, and I think the reason this picture sticks with me is that I was maybe two or three feet from her when she got arrested. And um, you, we photographed a lot of arrests during the time, but this one, I was so close to her and she had this, this panic on her eyes because we were just pretty, we, it was pretty new in the protest. The federal officers hadn't been there for that long. And there was some confusion about who they were. They weren't really marked. Um, and the picture is of the federal officer pulling her back into the courthouse and she's reaching out with her hand and she's reaching out right to me because I was the only one there. Um, she was screaming. She was terrified. Um, and I understand why there's, you know, you can say what you want about like you take all risks when you go to a protest, but I don't think anybody's prepared for a dude and all camo and a gas mask who's big and strong arm pulling you back into a dark alleyway. Like that, that would be terrifying for anybody. Um, and she really had this terrified look in her face during the arrest. Um, and that stuck with me for a long time and it still does. And I know because I've spoken with um, friends of hers that she ended up being released the next day and she was okay. But um, it was a really terrifying moment and she was screaming as she was being pulled back in. And I still hear that sometimes because it was just, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to explain uh, real terror uh, when you see it, like it, but it's something that sticks with you when somebody is just like deeply afraid for their lives with somebody else. And it's, you know, unfortunately we see sometimes in this job, but that was one of those moments. Um, so that picture definitely sticks with me. And, and there was a lot in 2020 that, um, has that same effect. I don't think I sent it to you, but um, on the 100th day of protest in Portland, it, uh, protesters threw um, a Molotov cocktail at a police line that me and some other photographers are right up next to, and it barely missed us. We almost got hit by it. Um, and they hit another protester with a with their own Molotov cocktail, and I have a picture of him trying to, he's like running past the camera, and he's trying to, you know, not be on fire anymore. Um, and that one sticks with me too because there's a video. The, the picture I think is important and impactful, and I can send it to you if you want. But it's also a video uh, taken slightly further back of the mall top, like coming over us and almost hitting us. And I think sometimes in this job, we have such a barrier to what's going on. Like we're looking through the viewfinder, and it almost looks like a different world because you've got this physical and mental barrier between you and what's happening in front of you. Um, but that was a moment where you go back and look at the video, and you're like, oh man. Almost got hit with a Molotov cocktail. That is not a good situation. Um, so that stuck with me for a while too. Um, I think besides that, on a slightly less <laughs> dark, uh, dark scale, um, there's a picture I took in 2019, I think, of these hunters that are out looking for pheasants. It was part of a story about um, trying to reincorporate hunting into this community in Vancouver, Washington, which is just north of Portland, and uh, this bird flew out of the bush right between me and the hunter. And I had this really fun moment of like the bird up in the air and the hunter like trying to track it. And it was just, it was just one of those things where you couldn't have planned it. You just got lucky. Um, and it was a lovely picture and, and that was a lot of fun. So those are some, those are some of the things that stick with me. I find that the pictures um, that, that stick with me the longest are the ones that, um, it's not necessarily the biggest, coolest event or the most important story, but that I feel some sort of connection to the subject. Um, another one that jumps out to me is um, I did this story on this this young man named uh, Kane who was getting adopted, and we were, really it was a story about some of the redundancies and the red tape that were causing issues with the adoption system um, in the city I was living in. But we followed this young man that was getting adopted for. Um, three, four months, I followed him around and took pictures of kind of the balance that uh, he was nine I think, at the time, that he had to walk between his biological parents who he had lost custody of because of some pretty terrible, oh, sorry, that his biological parents had lost custody of him because of some pretty terrible physical and mental and drug abuse um, that he had been subjected to. And we were following him as 
he was going through the adoption process with his new family. Um, and there's a picture of him dancing in his living room uh, of his new family. And it, it was just a moment of him looking carefree for the first time that I'd seen him. And this was months into the story. And he was a kid that always, you know, he was a kid, but he had so much going on in his life that he kind of always had this tense, nervous look about him. And um, there was a moment there where he, I just kind of caught him naturally. I'm ready to treat. I, he realized I was there. Um, and he's just dancing in, the, in his living room. And it's moments like that that stick out to me. And I think early in my career, I didn't realize that the pictures that were going to mean most to me were the ones of these kind of unguarded, intimate moments um, of, of quiet daily life, not the big, exciting pictures of national stories. So, again, kind of a long answer, but uh, yeah. How do you deal with that fear of covering things that might put you into danger? Yeah, I think that um, usually uh, when I'm photographing something that is dangerous, I'm not always fully aware of how dangerous it is at the moment. I mean, things happen very quickly. Um, I know that in my career, I've been in a couple shootouts um, in the middle of them. Um, I've been held at gunpoint once. Um, I've been in wildfires. I've been in riots and protests. And, you know, you always kind of logically know know that things are dangerous but when you're looking through the viewfinder um it can really have a i don't want to say a numbing effect but it can make you feel a little bit distant from the dangers that you're they're witnessing um so you know you try to be safe you try to make sure that you're working in a team you try to make sure that people know where you are and what you're doing um and you try to just use your best judgment but I'm not sure. It's pretty rare, I think, for me to be, if I'm photographing dangerous, something dangerous, to be scared in the moment. Sometimes I'll look back. I know I spoke earlier about Portland and that Molotov cocktail. I look back on that moment now, and that's a very scary moment for me um, because that could have been very, very bad for me and a lot of a lot of my friends who were there working with me. Um, but at the time, you know, you don't necessarily realize how dangerous and scary things are. Um, you know, I think that there's been some times in the last few years where I can sense things are about to get really dangerous. You start to feel that adrenaline and you start to get that like metal taste in your mouth from the, from the adrenal glands activating. Um, and in those moments, I try to just take a deep breath, make sure I know where I am, make sure that I know this is, you know, I'm in the right position. I try to ask myself, like, is this important enough to be here? Is it worth whatever danger is gonna about to happen to, to put myself in do to get the picture? And nine times out of ten, the, the answer is yes. Um, but I think it's important to check in with yourself, um, and make sure that you you're have the right motivations for for why you're there taking pictures. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It can just it's just a tough thing. It's a tough balance you got to walk. Um, and I think it's important to remember that sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes you gotta take a step back and say, you know, this picture might be good, but is it worth getting shot or whatever? Um, there was once in 2022, I think, in Portland, where some far-right activists, proud members of the Proud Boys and some other groups and some far-left kind of black bloc folks had really, they spent the whole day kind of going at it downtown, and there ended up being a, a shooting um, in a major, like, downtown area. Myself and a couple of the journalists were hiding behind a, the engine block of a car while this was happening because it was you know 20 feet from us um and you know i think one photographer stuck his he kind of was blindly taking pictures over the over the hood of the car and the rest of us were just like this is not it's not worth it to to poke our head up and get shot because of this this moment um so it's good to and there's been other times where shootings have been happening and you're sprinting straight towards it so i think it's just important to try to check in and and keep an eye on how important this picture is and and what am I going to do to get it. So there's no no easy answer. It's kind of a calculation you're making at all times. Can you tell me a bit about your project, Taking Her Medicine? Sure. That was shot for um, the Columbian, which is a newspaper in Southwest Washington. And um, it was um, really a look at Suboxone, which is a uh, it's an opioid receptor blocker in the brain and it's being used more and more as a treatment for opioid addiction and basically what it does is it um, I'm not a doctor but basically what it does is it makes it so your brain a 
does not receive the dopamine levels that opioids normally cause your body to produce. Um, and it also can um, reduce your cravings to use opioids. And so it's been used a lot um, as a treatment for folks who are going through opioid addiction. Um, and the, the woman that we followed for that story had had a skydiving accident. Um, I can't remember how many years before we met her, but it had been a while and she had fractured her neck and been prescribed pretty heavy doses of opioids as a painkiller at the time following some surgery and um, some recovery. And then she began abusing them and um, suffered from an opioid addiction that uh, took a really strong toll on her life and her body. And um, she had begun being treated with Suboxone. And so we were kind of looking at it as, um, as an entry point to talk about Suboxone. And we, we spent about three weeks with her and kind of as she was trying to get her life back under control and um, see if this was a, a treatment option that was going to allow her to kind of um, stay out of the cycle of addiction. And, and it had helped her a lot. And she was getting, she was having a job for the first time and um, in years and um, her cravings had gone away. And so that was good. But that, that story was also quite a challenge. And I think that anybody that's worked for a daily newspaper, especially a smaller one, will um, sympathize with this. You know, we had great visions for that story and, um, you know, we were really limited by the time we were able to actually spin with her because we had other job responsibilities, we had to go cover daily stuff. Um, so it wasn't quite as in-depth as I think I would have liked it to, to be. Um, and unfortunately that is just the reality. Like it would be great to spend months and months on every story and, um, you know, really, and then the stories often deserve that you do, but sometimes you have to find a way to tell the story and, you know, only, only meeting with the person three or four times. And, um, that is one of the fun challenges of being a daily, daily uh, newspaper photographer is sometimes you have to figure out a way to do less with more. Um, and that was something that happened on that story. It would have been great. Like me and the videographer, uh, who's also now a photographer, she was a photographer at the time, uh, Alicia Jusevic, we spent I think we met up with her four or five times and the subject four or five times in that story. And it would have been really great to meet up with her more and spend some more time on it and the story deserved it. But unfortunately we got cut short scheduling and budget issues. So uh, yeah, that was, that was that story. And, and uh, it was an entry point into the opioid epidemic. And uh, I think some other people have done that story better, but I think we did an okay job on it. So. Um, you've done so many important projects and unfortunately we don't have time to talk about them all. Are there any in particular you'd like to talk about? Um, great question. Um, yeah, you know, in 2022, maybe it was 2021, um, for the Associated Press, I spent, um, a week up in Yukon, Alaska, in the Yukon in Alaska. And, um, uh, got to spend some time with um, an indigenous village called Stevens Village. That's the name of the place. Um, and they were kind of um, the front lines, for lack of a better term, for a big issue we're seeing, uh, uh, especially in frontier areas where climate change is affecting um, the population of major cornerstone food sources. So for them, for the entirety of the time that their indigenous village has been there. Um, they have lived, really survived off the cycle of salmon runs. Um, and, you know, they, they fish heavily through the spring and, uh, and also in the fall. And then they use the supplies of salmon that they get in those times to subsist through the winter. Uh, well, this year that we went up there, the, there were literally no salmon that uh, just normally millions that run along the Yukon River and they're able to fish for them and it's very much a part of their life and their tradition. Um, in the year that we went up there, there it's not that there were less salmon, there were no salmon. Um, there had been no salmon during the salmon run and that is um, something that we will continue to see as, as climate change affects population die-offs. Um, and we were kind of using Stevens Village to talk about how, you know, there are these human impacts to climate change on the periphery of society but as this stuff gets worse, we will start to see that impact mainstream life in cities, just how it's now currently affecting life in the Yukon. So it's been a week up there, um, kind of looking at, you know, how they were trying to um, overcome that lack of their main food source. 
Um, and what they were doing was doing big animal hunts, which was not something they normally do. Um, elk, uh, I'm sorry, moose, um, and really any anything that they could find um, that they could hunt leading up to the winter because this village is 160 miles as the crow flies from your nearest grocery store. You know, if you run out of food, you can't go down the safe way. There isn't one. So, um, and and there are times they call it the freeze um, in the winter where you cannot get in and out of the village. There's really no no way to do it. The weather's too bad to fly. The weather's too bad to take a snow uh, snowmobile. They call them snow machines. Um, so yeah, we spent a week up there with them as they were doing their hunts to try to uh, try to uh, prepare for the winter. And and um, they showed us some of the traditions that were dying off because they weren't able to fish for salmon. And some of the younger generations were leaving the village because there wasn't a future there. Um, and got to meet some really great people and, and learn about some of the challenges they were facing and, and how they were approaching it. And it was a it was a great story. And um, I was really thankful the editors at AP were um, willing to send me up there for so long. And um, Hopefully, I would like to go back at some point in time and, and do a follow up on that story as well, but not currently in the cards. When I asked um, Stephen Crowley about his motto, he said, Long climb, low hang time. <laughs> when I asked Kenny Holston about his motto, he said, High speed, low drag. Do you have a motto? Um, nothing quite as uh, inspiring as theirs. Uh, you know, I think if I had one, it would be, um, you know, you just have to be there. I think sometimes with stories, it can be very hard to figure out how you approach this. What's my entry point? How am I going to possibly uh, take this entire person's existence and put it into 12 pictures to tell the story across? And I think the most important thing is to not get too in your head about it. And just remember, like, you just have to be there looking through the camera um and eventually those moments will will reveal themselves to you um but if you're not there you can't see them so i think yeah just you just have to be there um which is not quite as as fun as kenny's uh but uh i think we all have different ways that we approach stuff so yeah can you give me an insight into what it's like covering major washington politics yeah it's kind of like a weird organized circus um that seems to be very coordinated but at times it's just chaos um you know like for example if um we're covering the president um or if you're traveling with the president you know there is uh sometimes months of preparation that go into these trips and at the same time we're sometimes not getting planning information until the night before and so it's all this preparation for these highly coordinated things and then usually something goes wrong the president's running late a meeting gets canceled and it all gets it all gets rescheduled and reshifted around uh and so you kind of just have to be there and be along for the ride um and that can be a challenge in and of itself um and at the same time it's all it's all performative in many ways you know there are um a lot of what these politicians do they do for the camera and they they are kind of relying on us to be there and take pictures or videos to, to tell whatever story or narrative they're trying to get across and so as a photojournalist you're walking this fine line between you know we need to make compelling pictures of what's happening for this national story but you also need to be aware that like a lot of what they're doing they're doing for you and it, it is quite performative and so for me i tried to not as much as possible Try to not let them have the perfect little photo op that they've created for themselves and we've shown up to, to take pictures of. It's important to to move that head-on picture of them in their photo op and in their stage. But I try to lift up the, the curtain a little bit and, and show viewers what's happening behind the scenes. Because I think it's important to remember that um, uh, these are just people. My wife, who was a journalist for many years and now works in PR, she has a saying, which is that everybody everybody is only ever just a person. Uh, and it doesn't matter how prominent, if it's President you know, Biden, or if it's just some dude down the street that you're doing a picture story of, like these are only just people and they have the same machinations that you and I do and they have the same concerns and the same worries. And so I try my best to uh, to, to lift the curtain a little bit and show people uh, kind of the human side of, of these larger than life characters. I don't think I always succeed, but it is something that I, I try to keep an eye on. What or who motivates you and what advice would you give to any aspiring photographers? Um, I mean, there's, there's photographers that I've always been um, 
just enthralled with. Aaron Huey, who shoots um, a lot for National Geographic, I think is phenomenal. He's somebody that I found young and um, I still work to his work to be inspired. Um, I mentioned earlier a, a friend and mentor of mine, Tyler Tromsland, um, phenomenal photographer, just loves the, the local newspaper life and he does incredible work. Um, uh, um, Beth Nakamura, another person I mentioned earlier, just has these really intimate beautiful pictures. I think I tend to be inspired really by people who shoot very differently than me. I think I have a very like literal eye. Like if, I, if I'm photographing something going on, like I'm photographing the thing and I'm trying to get a clean picture out of it. And I think a lot of that comes from the work that I do for the wires. But then I find myself really drawn to pictures that are a little bit less literal, a little bit more like each role and they kind of speak to a moment. Um, and I've always been very impressed by photographers who are able to do that because it's something that I struggle with. Um, so I look for that. I look for pictures that are kind of unique and weird. I mentioned that before. I just like weird pictures. Um, uh, Tom Brenner does a really good job with that. Um, and then, you know, uh, I'm inspired by really anything visual. I, I find a lot of inspiration from uh, graphic novels and from from paintings and, and like Renaissance paintings. Um, DC is a great town because we have we have the Smithsonian's and they change the galleries all the time. You can just go walk around and see cool stuff. Um, and I just kind of, I'm inspired by anything that makes me think twice or make me see the world uh, slightly differently. Um, and so I look for that as much as possible. Such a successful career. Um, is there anything you'd change in hindsight? Yeah, I think, I mentioned earlier when you had asked about uh, photographers who might be in a small town who were kind of like itching to get to a bigger story. I think that when I was in, when I was working at a, a smaller newspapers and on a local level, I don't think I quite appreciated what I had at the time. And I had all this free time to go work on projects and stories and I had a whole areas of, of the state that I was in where there, there weren't another, there wasn't another photojournalist for hundreds of miles. And I don't think I quite took advantage of that as much as um, I would now. Um, and at the time, I just wanted to go up and work for bigger, more prominent papers and get my name out there more. And I think looking back now, um, I kind of kick myself. And I'm like, you idiot. You had you had this huge area where, where everybody was open to you photographing them and there was no competition. You could spend as much time as you wanted on these these cool stories that you, you, know, you can't see anywhere else. Um, and I, kinda, I think I took it for granted a little bit. So that would be one thing. But... Um, you know, I'm pretty happy with how my career has, has gone. I think, you know, I'm still relatively early in it. Um, and hopefully I will continue to uh, get to just take pictures for the rest of my life. I think they'll have to pull the camera out of my, my cold dead hand when I, when I pass. I hope I have a camera in my hand to the last minute. But, um, you know... So we'll see. I think there's plenty of time still to make mistakes and hopefully I don't make any more than I have to, but I'm sure I will. But that's kind of part of the fun. You you learn from the mistakes that you make and you um and uh you become a better photographer because of it. I think I think the worst thing you can do is not, you know, uh, is to make mistakes and then say, Oh, well, I'll never do that again. Of course you will. And I think you just have to try to try to learn from it a little bit. I've, I've had stories that have fallen through. I've had pictures that just didn't work. I've had editors that I've, you know, disappointed because I didn't shoot the way that they wanted to or the way that I wanted to. Um, and that stuff's going to happen. And all you can do is kind of just uh, smile and, and laugh about it and, and try to make sure you don't make those same mistakes again. So, Before we wrap up, what are you up to now and what are your plans for the future? Great question. Um, I mentioned before that I'd been up in, up in, uh, the Yukon and Alaska and there's a follow-up on that story I really want to do um, I don't want to give away too many details because uh, anybody could pitch it but um, I really want to get back up there and, and continue doing that story um, I am very interested in stories on large climate disasters the micro and macro levels of it so like looking at these big devastating wildfires but also looking at like the individual communities that are being affected by it um, so I'm keeping an eye on that out West. Um, I am part of a, um, a legislative advisory committee, I guess you might call it, that's working to get access to wildfires in the West. Um, 
much more open to journalists. Right now, it could be very restrictive in anywhere that isn't California. Um, and we're working with the state government to try to change the laws around that. Actually, the laws have been changed, but now we're trying to get the guidelines in place that will allow journalists to um, have as much access as we need to tell that story effectively. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, I'm getting ready for the 2024 presidential campaign, um, which will be chaos here in America. Um, I just got back from Miami, where former President Donald Trump was indicted on 37 felonies, I think. Um, and that is going to be a storyline that's going to continue through the 2024 campaign. And so that's going to be interesting. Um, and I'm keeping an eye on the far right in the U.S. That's so somebody that's a group that I've covered quite a bit, um, specifically the Proud Boys. Um, they've been relatively quiet following January 6th when a lot of them were arrested and charged with felonies, but um, their organization is becoming a little bit more vocal as trans rights in America are um, really under attack. Um, and so that's those are all kind of things that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, and uh, I'm also trying to remember that uh, as fun as this job is, sometimes it's important to take a break and go for a walk with your dog or sit on a patio and drink a glass of wine and and take time to, to be myself. I think that I struggle to um, not work myself to death. Um, I try to work as much as possible. And I, you know, after a certain while, you get mentally and physically exhausted and you can't, you can't shoot very well anymore. So also trying to remember to take a break when I can. Uh, so when I get back to it, my work is good and sharp and I'm not tired. So. Thank you so much for watching right until the end. I'd really appreciate if you could send it to anyone you know would be interested because the bigger the podcast gets, the bigger the guests get.